Welcome to the first of our video lectures on energetics. We're going to look at enthalpies of reaction in this little piece. We're going to define energy, potential, and kinetic. We're going to look at the laws of thermodynamics. We're going to describe energy transfers and transformations. We're going to define heat and enthalpy and exothermic and endothermic reactions. We're going to calculate some molar enthalpy. We're also going to calculate heat of reactions. We're going to analyze potential energy profiles and wrap up with a little look at specific heats. So first up, lots of vocabulary, different kinds of energy, energy for us in chemistry, the capacity or ability to do work or supply heat. We're going to look a lot at that heat piece. Kinetic energy and potential energy are two big types of energy that we are going to talk about here in chemistry. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion for us. Thermal energy is going to be proportional to how much kinetic energy there is. So the more the molecules, the particles, the atoms are moving, the more energy they have, the warmer they feel to us, the higher that temperature. Potential energy, we talk about that in middle school science about like gravity and if you hold something way up high off the earth, it has more potential energy because it has more space to fall. For us, potential energy the energy of position or arrangement is all about how atoms are bound together in molecules. So we have lots of energy stored in chemical bonds. This is our potential energy in chemistry. And of course, there's lots of other kinds of energy, but for us, we're going to focus mostly on kinetic, heat, thermal energy, and potential energy, energy stored in chemical bonds. We have some laws of thermodynamics to talk about. Thermodynamics and energetics kind of the same things. Um, I am highly entertained by the fact that there is a zeroth law, and the zeroth law states that if two things are equal to each other, and there's a third thing that's also equal to the first thing that is also equal to the second thing, yeah, literally there's a law for that. It's fine. We're fine. Everything is fine. Um, first law of thermodynamics is the one that we're going to talk about the most in chemistry. Just like we have the law of conservation of matter, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. We have the law of conservation of energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. We can transfer it and we can transform it, but we cannot create or destroy. Second law of thermodynamics just states that everything tends toward chaos. Entropy increases in natural systems. That's disorder. Um, basically, giant molecules do not like to be stuck together. It's more stable for them to fall apart into little pieces. And then the third law of thermodynamics, we'll talk about this more in our next unit um, when we talk about Calvin um, as a measure of temperature and absolute zero. So this idea that if we approach absolute zero, which means that there's no more kinetic energy than entropy disorder is going to have to stay the same. It can't change anymore. So energy transfers, we can neither create nor destroy energy, but we can transfer energy from one object to another. Um, some examples are conduction, convection, and radiation, which is a transfer of thermal energy. Conduction is the um, transfer through contact. So if I put my hand on the um, pot, Heat will be conducted from the pot to my hand. It'll feel hot to me. That's conduction. Convection are currents. So we have heat. Um, heat here is heating up the air. That hot air is rising. That is convection. Then radiation is simply those heat waves, that infrared radiation that is transferring heat from one object to another. Heat, this word heat is kind of quirky in chemistry. So heat is actually the energy that is transferred from one body to another due to temperature differences. And we use the letter Q for heat, which is weird because there's definitely not a Q in H-E-A-T. Um, but nonetheless, Q is heat. Interestingly, heat always flows from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. So, so if I put my hand on a hot hot plate, heat will flow from the hot plate to my hand because there's more heat in the hot plate than in my hand. Interestingly, if you put ice in your lemonade, the ice is not making your lemonade cold. My friends, your lemonade is giving energy away to the ice to warm up the ice. And that's what makes the lemonade get colder because it's giving energy away to the ice. The ice does not make the lemonade cold. The lemonade makes the ice warmer. Crazy sauce. Enthalpy is kind of like heat, but heat is that transfer of energy, that difference in energy. Enthalpy is just the energy content of a system by itself, so not moving it yet. Um, but because I cannot measure how much energy is stored in chemical bonds, 
unless I break the chemical bonds and release the energy from them. Most of the time we don't talk about enthalpy by itself, but we talk about the change in enthalpy, which is that heat transfer. So remember that delta means change. So change in enthalpy is going to be the same thing as that heat transfer. So Q or heat and change in enthalpy, enthalpy we use letter H for, change in enthalpy, all the same things. Q is the same thing as delta H, heat of reaction, enthalpy of reaction, change in enthalpy, change in heat, these are all the same things. So let's talk about molar enthalpy because we do love moles. So heat of formation is the enthalpy or energy um, that is needed to form one mole of a compound from its elements, um, either the energy that is needed or the energy that is released. So when I look at the heat of formation of methane, methane is the gas that's in our Bunsen burners, the heat of formation is negative 18 joules per mole. That negative means that energy is being released to the environment. So this is a release of energy. Um, 18 joules per mole of methane is released when methane is formed from carbon and hydrogen because this is more stable than these guys, which are kind of wiggly and jiggly all by themselves. So if we have negative 18 joules for one mole, how much energy is released when we have two moles of methane? Well, you're probably thinking we can just multiply that by two. Yes, we can. And the answer will be negative 36 joules per mole. I can actually use my railroad tracks for this if I have two moles of methane. And we know that it's negative 18 joules per mole. That's per one mole. Then notice that I can cancel out moles top and bottom. And what we are left with is 2 times negative 18 divided by 1, which is once again that negative 36 joules per, I put per mole over here. That's not right. It should be per two moles, not per one mole. Um, what about this one? How much energy is released when two grams of methane is formed? This one, my friends, we have to do some mole conversions. So I'm going to start with my two grams of methane. My problem is telling me that methane has a molar mass of 16 grams per one mole. I put grams on the bottom so that I can cancel it out. Grams on top and bottom cancel out. Now I have moles of methane, but I don't want moles of methane. I want energy. So I'm going to put moles on the bottom. I'm going to put energy on the top. I'm going to go back to this constant that was given to me at the top of the page. I have negative 18 joules per one mole. So now notice I can cancel out moles top and bottom and we're left with joules. So when I do this math, 2 divided by 16 times negative 18, final answer is a negative 2.25 joules. We could all say that 2.25 joules of energy is released or we could say that delta H is equal to negative 2.25 joules. First law of thermodynamics, let's review this, it says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. This is super important for our chemical reaction. So all of the energy in a reaction has to be conserved. Everything has to come from someplace and it has to go someplace. So if I have energy in the reactants that's different from energy in the products, then I have to transfer or transform that difference because the law of conservation of energy says so. So let's think about combustion of methane. So again, this is the gas that's in our Bunsen burners. What energy transformations and transfers, I should have thrown transfers in here, would we observe when we burn methane? Well, we know that there's some heat. We know that there's some light. Um, sometimes there's some sparkly things if our, if our Bunsen burner isn't super clean, if our line has some stuff in it. Heat and light are the big ones, right? So these are our big transformations. That heat energy, that, that energy that can either warm up our compounds or our hand if we're next to the Bunsen burner, this heat is coming from energy that is stored in the bonds of the methane molecule that do not need to be given to carbon dioxide or water because they have less energy stored in them. And so we can get rid of some of that extra energy. We give it away to the environment. We can't destroy it. It can't just disappear, but we can allow that heat to be sent out to the environment. And that's what we get with warm things coming from our Bunsen burners. 
So if the enthalpy of the reactants is greater than the enthalpy of the products, all of that extra energy that used to be in the reactants needs to be transferred to the surroundings, just like with our Bunsen burners. If the enthalpy of the reactants is less than what we need to put into the products, then we need to get that extra enthalpy from the surroundings and heat. Enthalpy is going to be absorbed from the surroundings into the products. We're going to call that an endothermic reaction. So exo energy is coming out of the reaction given away to the surroundings. Endothermic energy be energy is being sucked in, endo in, we're sucking energy into the reaction from the surroundings. So methane's combustion, do we think that's endothermic or exothermic? We definitely just talked about how there's lots of heat released. It is absolutely exothermic. We're going to allow some heat to be propagated from the reaction. That heat is going to warm up the air or whatever else is around the Bunsen burner. The combustion of methane is actually so exothermic that 890 kilojoules is released. 890 kilojoules of energy is released for every one mole of methane that is combusted. And I can kind of add this to my balanced equation like a mole ratio. So if I want to know one mole of methane combusting, how much energy is released, I can absolutely use that 890 number. So 890 kilojoules is released. That's a lot of energy. I could also say that the delta H, that change in enthalpy, is negative 890 kilojoules because that energy is being lost from the methane and given away to the surroundings. If I want to know if I have one mole of oxygen gas reaction, how much energy is released, can I say the same thing? Is it still 890? Notice that the coefficient on oxygen is 2. That means that I have that negative 890 kilojoules for every 2 moles of oxygen, not for every 1. So I can use my railroad tracks if I have 1 mole of oxygen gas. I see that 2 moles of oxygen gas is proportional to 890 kilojoules released, which is why that negative is there. And then I can figure out that my final answer is going to be 495 kilojoules of energy released. I could also say that the delta H is a negative 495 kilojoules because that negative is telling us the energy is being released. Let's do this one is super similar, so combustion of methane, but now I'm looking at 32 grams of methane combusting. So 32 grams of methane, of course, the first step is to turn those grams into moles. I'm going to put grams on the bottom and moles on the top to get those grams to cancel out. Remember that the molar mass of methane was 16, and we do that by rounding carbon to 12. Each of those hydrogens is just about one, so we've got 16 grams per one mole. And what we have right here are our grams canceling out top and bottom. So now I want to get rid of moles of methane. I'm going to do that by using my proportion from kilojoules to moles of methane. So I want to get those kilojoules. I'm going to put 890 kilojoules on the top. I want to get rid of methane. I'm going to put one mole of methane on the bottom because there is an invisible one right there. So now I can cancel out top and bottom my moles of methane. With my handy dandy calculator, 32 divided by 16 should be equal to 2 times 890 gives us a delta H of negative 1,780 kilojoules. We could also say that 1,780, sorry, 1,780 1, kilojoules of energy is released because that negative is telling us that energy is being released, given away to the surroundings. Another way for us to calculate enthalpy of reaction, um, if I'm not using that molar enthalpy, is I can use this formula, which is on our formula sheet instead. So enthalpy of reaction can be the difference between the products and the reactants. So it's kind of going back to that idea that we talked about a couple slides ago, in which if the reactants have more energy than the products need, then the extra has to get given away. The products need more than the reactants have. They have to suck it in from the environment. That's exactly what this math is doing for us. We're just going to take the enthalpy of all of the products and subtract the enthalpy of all the reactants. So here's a super quick little conceptual question. So if the enthalpy of A is equal to 10 
and the enthalpy of B is 5. So my reactant has 10 units of energy. My product only needs 5 of those units of energy. Well, we know we've got 5 extra. So there are 5 units of energy that have to be given away to the environment because the reactants have more than the products. If I were to do this with my formula, delta H is going to be the products minus the reactants, I'm going to do 5 because my products have 5 units of energy minus 10 because my reactants have 10. And that's going to give me a negative 5, which exactly matches, I was just talking about, those extra 5 units of energy that have to be given away or released into the environment. So because those are extras, they're lost from the reaction, it is an exothermic reaction, five units of energy is given away. It's exothermic. Let's look at the same idea, but now we're going to do it in a graphical kind of way with these super cool things that are known as potential energy profiles or potential energy diagrams. Potential energy is here on the y-axis. We've got potential energy on the y-axis, and then we have reaction progress or time along the x-axis. In this situation here on the left, I have reactants at this level. This is the energy that we need to add to get all the bonds in the reactants to break. This is all the energy that is released when the new bonds and the products are formed. And then here are the products way down here. My reactants are up here. My products are down here. That means that my products don't need all of the energy that I had stored in my reactants. Energy could be given away to the environment. Energy was released. That makes this an exothermic reaction. This guy is the opposite here. I have an endothermic reaction. Notice that my reactants are down here. Products are up here. This is all the energy that we have to add to break all the bonds in the reactants. This is the energy that is released when I form the new bonds in the products. The products have more energy stored in them than the reactants had. And so we had to absorb energy from the surroundings to get that extra energy that the products need that the reactants don't have. Let's calculate the enthalpy of reaction using this potential energy diagram. Potential energy again here on the y-axis. And I'm going to do products minus reactants. Products are here reactants are here. So my product number is 100. Products minus reactants. Reactants are 50. 100 minus 50 is a positive 50 kilojoules. I know that my answer is going to be in kilojoules because the unit is right there. Positive 50 kilojoules. And this makes sense because we had to add 50 kilojoules of energy from the surroundings because the reactants only had 50 and the products needed 100. So our delta H is going to be a positive delta H. It's going to be a positive 50 kilojoules. And because it's positive, we have to add energy from the surroundings to get all the energy that the products need. This is an endothermic reaction. I can also show heat as part of the equation. We can call those thermochemical equations. So say here I have my reactants A and B, and I'm adding heat energy to make my products, endothermic or exothermic. Hopefully you're thinking, ooh, we are adding heat into the system. That must be endothermic. You'd be right. How about this one where I have A decomposing into B with heat being produced, propagated, released at the end of the reaction. That makes it exothermic because that heat is being released, um, sent out into the environment. So I've been talking a lot about kilojoules and joules already. So kilojoules and joules, these are our metric units of energy. But calorie is another way to describe energy. And this is how we describe energy that is stored in our food, right? Interestingly, though, the food in uh, our food labels, calories are not these calories. They're these calories. So a calorie with a lowercase c in the front of it, little c, calorie, it's a quantity 
of heat that is going to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So if I had one gram of water, that would be enough water to fill one centimeter that was a centimeter cube, a cube that has one centimeter on each edge. Um, so if I have this one gram of water and I heat it up for maybe 10 degrees Celsius to 11 degrees Celsius, I would need one calorie of energy to make that happen. Food labels are not given to us in little c calories. They're given to us in big c calories, which are actually kilocalories or kcals, and that's equal to 1,000 calories. So in our food labels, if it's like, there's only 30 calories, well, it's 30 big c calories, which is 30,000 little c calories. So enough energy to heat 30,000 grams of water by one degree Celsius. Kind of crazy sauce, but that's how we roll here. Um, so that one calorie is equal to 4.18 joules. So this is our conversion between the two. Memorize this. No, you don't have to because it's on your list of constants and conversions on your reference pages. You also should know on your reference pages how to find that 1,000 calories. Little c calories is equal to one big c calorie, which is the same thing as a kcal. If you travel outside of the United States, a lot of the food labels not here are in kcals instead of big c calories. We're going to talk about one more idea, and then we're going to call this lecture done, my friends. So specific heat, um, which is a C, and I guess there's kind of a C in specific heat. Uh, so specific heat, sometimes we use C little p, um, is the amount of heat that we need to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. We we're just talking about how water had a specific heat of one calorie, and one calorie is the same thing as 4.18 joules. So the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. I need this much energy to heat one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. So this is for liquid water. Notice lead way down here at the bottom, only 0.13 of a joule. So this is, I don't know, this is like 40 times more energy is needed to heat up the water than to heat up the lead. So we can warm up metals way faster with less energy. We can cool off those metals. They don't have to lose as much energy to cool off as compared to water. But, but we are made mostly of water, and that's really good because it means that our body temperatures don't change super, super fast because we need a lot of energy to heat up the water that makes up our bodies. We need to lose a lot of energy to cool down that water that makes up the majority of our bodies. So this idea of specific heat, we're going to use it in this formula, Q equals MC delta T. And the specific heat for water is one calorie per one gram degree Celsius or 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. We're going to use that not on the next slide, but in a couple slides. So hold on to that idea. So this formula, Q equals MC delta T, heat, which is the same thing as delta H, which is the same thing as enthalpy. So these are all the same things. Well, change in enthalpy. It's going to be equal to mass. That's the M specific heat. That's the C change in temperature. Change in temperature. We're going to do final temperature. That's TF minus initial temperature. That's TI. So final minus initial is going to give us the change in temperature. Let's practice. So the specific heat of ethanol is 2.46 joules per gram degree Celsius. That means that I need 2.46 joules of energy to warm up one gram of ethanol by one degree Celsius. So let's say that I've got 193 grams of ethanol and I want to warm it up from 19 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. Well, for my formula, I need MC delta T. M is the mass. It's right here. C is a specific heat. It's right here. Delta T, delta T is going to be final minus initial. My final temperature is at 35 degrees Celsius. My initial temperature was 19 degrees Celsius. That's a difference of 16 degrees Celsius. So this is my delta T. Mass is 193 grams. Specific heat is 2.46 joules per gram degree Celsius. And our delta T is 16 degrees Celsius. Let's multiply 193 times 2.46 times 16 gives us a grand total of 7596.48. Let's do a quick sig fig check. 
looks like we get to keep two. So we're going to turn that nine, well, we're going to use the nine to turn the five into a six. And so our final answer is 7,600. And my unit label is going to be joules. And I will tell you why. This gram and this gram cancel out. This degree Celsius and this degree Celsius cancel out. And all we're left with is joules. So this is our answer in joules. What if I asked you for the answer in kilojoules? Well, remember that there's a thousand of anything in its kilo version. So we'll just divide 7,600 by 1,000, and we have 7.6 kilojoules of energy is needed to warm up all that ethanol. So let's say that I'm going to take some of that hydrochloric acid that I made in the lab a couple weeks ago and that sodium hydroxide um, that we also made, and I'm going to mix them together. And I want to figure out how much heat is propagated. I want to figure out my Q. What should I measure? Well, definitely some temperature changes. And we also need some masses. Temperature change went from 20 up to 32 degrees Celsius. So my delta T is going to be 32 minus 20. Delta T is equal to 12 degrees Celsius. What about my mass? So since our acid, one molar acid, was mostly water, I'm going to use the density of water, which is one gram per milliliter. So if I have 10 milliliters and the density is one gram, whoops, I need to put that on the bottom, one gram per milliliter, then milliliters top and bottom cancel out. We have 10 grams of acid. Same thing for our sodium hydroxide. Most of that sodium hydroxide was water. So if I have 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide and the density is one milliliter is equal to one gram, milliliters cancels out. And again, we have 10 grams of sodium hydroxide, mostly water, acid, mostly water. I'm gonna add those two together. My mass is going to be 20 grams. So Q equals MC delta T. Mass is gonna be 20 grams specific heat. Again, this is mostly water, so I'm going to use a specific heat of water, 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Multiply that by my delta T, that's 12. So I'm going to do 20 times 4.18 times 12, and our final answer is 1,003.2 joules. Sig fig check, and also I want to convert to kilojoules. I want to convert to kilojoules. And so divide by 1,000, that's going to be 1. And with my sig figs, I only get to keep 1 because there's only one sig fig here and one sig fig here. So 1 kilojoule of energy is propagated when we mix these two um, substances together. So we had 1 kilojoule of energy. I want to know... What is the molar heat of neutralization of hydrochloric acid in kilojoules per mole of hydrochloric acid? So now I need to take my kilojoules. I have one kilojoule. I need to divide it by the moles of HCl. How do I know how many moles of HCl I have? Let's go back to our problem. We know that we have one molar HCl and I have 10 milliliters of it. So if I have one molar, and molarity is equal to moles over liters, and 10 milliliters is equal to 0 0.010 liters, then I have 0 0.010 moles of hydrochloric acid. So if I have one kilojoule, and I have 0 0.010 moles of hydrochloric acid, and I want to find kilojoules per mole. Remember that per is the same thing as divide. I'm just going to take my kilojoules and divide it by my moles. I'm going to take my kilojoules. My kilojoules was one kilojoule. I'm going to divide it by the moles. I just figured out that that's 0 0.010 moles, and my answer is going to be one divided by 0 0.01. That is 100 kilojoules per mole. This is our molar enthalpy. Heat was released, right? The water got warmer because of the acid in the base being neutralized. That means that our delta H, also our Q, because they're the same things, is negative. Final answer, delta H, which is the same thing as Q, is going to be negative 100 kilojoules 
per mole of hydrochloric acid. We did it. Good work. Um, we talked about energy potential. Energy that's stored in chemical bonds. Kinetic energy that's how fast our molecules are moving, kind of like its temperature. We talked about the laws of thermodynamics. We really love the first law, which is the law of conservation of energy. We described energy, tra energy transfers and transformations. We talked about heat and enthalpy and that Q, which is heat, is the same thing as the change in enthalpy, which is delta H. We talked about exothermic and endothermic reactions. We calculated some molar enthalpy, how many joules per mole. We looked at heat of reaction. We can do that by either subtracting products minus reactants, or we can use Q equals MC delta T, which requires us to know what specific heat is. We also looked at those potential energy diagrams. This guy, which is endothermic because my products have more energy than my reactants. Good work today, my friends.